this is the area that is basically the folk village. And this year we are featuring Haiti. This particular tent is the cultural crossroads tent. And uh, we've, uh, for the last couple of days, we've been um, engaging in conversations about Haiti, the history of Haiti and New Orleans, and those very strong connections between the two. The two. And I also want to just uh, encourage you to take a look at the Haitian uh, village, the pavilion, and the other side of Congo Square if you get a chance. And it's a continuation of what is going on in here. Um, we like for our audience to uh, ask questions and or make comments and have criticisms at the end of the session. So if you just hold on, you have this burning question you have, just hold it to the end of the session and, and we will certainly uh, entertain that. Um, I would like to um, uh, definitely uh, give a shout out to our sponsors for this tent, the Green Family Foundation as well as the Louisiana Endowment for the Arts. Yes, let's give them a hand because without the funds we wouldn't have this today. Um, we have been, as I said, having a series of discussions here. Uh, we have talked about um, the history of the first day, the history of uh, a little bit of New Orleans and, and uh, Haiti and how those connections were made. We've talked about immigration, the mass migrations that took place uh, from Haiti to New Orleans during and after the revolution of uh, 1791 to this 13 year war to 1804 and then the, the mass migrations afterwards too and what resulted from those migrations uh, we have actually the city of New Orleans doubled in size and uh, not only the, um, the size of the population but we have all the culture that came in with it. So all the traditions like um, uh, dance and, and the literature, uh, opera, and, and it just goes on and on. But one of the things that was very significant too was the uh, religion of voodoo that we discussed yesterday. And we want to go on today uh, to move and to look at Congo Square, which is a very significant and sacred area here because it's you know there's so many things came out of that space uh, now just to say it has been um, listed on the historic register uh, national historic register I think it was in 1993 uh, and since then the Congo Square Foundation um, has uh, placed a marker in the plate in the, in the, in the site so without further ado I would like to introduce uh, my illustrious panel here all friends of mine um, and it's just wonderful to work with him today. It's Royce Osborne, he's a wonderful filmmaker. You might know him from uh, All on a Mardi Gras Day, the uh, piece he did on the New Orleans Mardi Gras Indians. And today we're gonna show us a short clip of his film, Spirits of Congo Square and Ancient African Traditions. And he'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Freddie Evans, independent scholar, uh, author, she's the author of some children's books, and of course, if you don't know by now, Congo Square, African Roots in New Orleans. Hot off the press, ladies and gentlemen, hot off the press. Get it. <laughs> it's available in the book tent. Yes, and it is available in the book tent. She did her signing the other day, but I'm sure, if, you know, you want to pick up some, she'll be around for a while today. Um, and we're just, um, Wonderful, and just all of us are really happy to, to see this out. Um, it's long, many, many years of um, rigorous research here, so please get to the copy. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Luther Gray. He's a uh, percussionist extraordinaire. Uh, Luther has been here, native of uh, New Orleans, for many years, and I'm sure you have heard his Bambula. He has the Bambula uh, Performing Arts Group. Uh, their uh, musical group as well as uh, dancers and he's done many uh, performances nationally as well as internationally so you should certainly pick up a copy of one of their CDs this one is the one again out of the press <laughs> we got in we got it going on <laughs> all right. and just to mention too I'm just getting all this in before we get into the discussion but but he, his group will be playing out here next Sunday on um, the Jazz and Heritage stage at 1.30, if you want to catch that. Okay, so we want to just start off by just giving you a small clip of um, 
Congo Square in sort of like a small nutshell, and then we're going to talk about these things later. But I'm going to let Royce talk about his piece on um, Congo Square, and uh, so you can just see that, and we'll we'll start from there. But it's a very significant area, and uh, Royce is going to tell you about the piece that he did. Uh, this this documentary is uh, this is the first. Um documentary I made in New Orleans when I moved back to the city and uh, I, I felt like I had I, I came back with the purpose of, of working on, on films about New Orleans history and culture particularly black history and culture and I, I, I thought it was necessary and appropriate to start with Congo Square because everything starts with Congo Square in this city uh, and I was uh, really fortunate to find uh, musicians and dancers uh, who could recreate uh, some of the traditional dances and music of Congo Square. And uh, there's also a, a, a narrative poem by Kalamu Yasalam. So it was a real, it was a real community effort to, to, to put this together. And uh, hopefully we'll expand it into a, a much grander piece about uh, Congo Square, because you can't really tell that history in four minutes. But uh, we, we give you a little taste of it. This is Spirits of Congo Square. It was a place of celebration and worship, of entertainment and commerce. A place where Africans gathered for a few hours of freedom to sell their goods, to play music and dance, and in the process, to preserve a culture as old as humanity. This is an oral libational toast to Congo Square, to Native Americans, to our ancestors who made a circle in a square us a way to stay ourselves, save ourselves. The Omus Indians prepared this place for us centuries before our arrival. A sacred spot where corn festivals were celebrated and colonizers came, they pushed aside our hosts and introduced us in chains. The first ships carrying African slaves arrived in New Orleans in 1790, a year after the city was founded by France. From the region of Senegambia, these Africans provided the labor needed to develop the colony, which was facing starvation. They brought all the skills necessary for the survival of the colony. They also brought with them a culture which would become vital to the development of New Orleans and to the nation at large. By the time of the Louisiana Purchase, an influx of Haitian immigrants had doubled the city's population and added a new ingredient to the gumbo of New Orleans. The Code Noir was introduced to govern both African slaves and free people of color. One of its articles exempted slaves from labor on Sundays and religious holidays. On these days, they were allowed to work their own plot land, hire themselves out for wages, or take their produce into town and sell it. They gathered for dances on a plot of ground outside the city walls, a place that became known as Congo Square. And by the late 1700s, we somehow recognized the sacredness of La Paz, Congo. We crafted and created a space where we could be free to be we. They were summoned by the thunderous beat of the drum. The people a range of backgrounds, nations, and social levels. Wolof, Bambara, Mandingo, and Fon, Fula, Soso, Congo, and Yoruba. From all parts of the city and nearby plantations, free people of color, even some escaped slaves, who lived in the swamps and marshes that surrounded the city, were drawn to Congo Square by the the drum. The dances were performed in rings or circles, with each circle comprised of 50 to 100 dancers. For these Africans, an opportunity to dance was also an opportunity to worship. Their dance was an expression of the freedom they had lost. For many of them, a freedom were known. Our dance is our walk. Our music is the God talk. Our African gods have not been obliterated. They have merely retreated inside the beat of us until we are ready to release them into a world that we recreate. 
At sundown, a cannon was fired, signaling the end of the dance. But the gatherings at Congo Square continued until the war. And African culture had gained a foothold in New Orleans that would lead to the development of jazz and other styles of popular music and dance. Congo Square is still a gathering place for the people of New Orleans, a place of culture and religion, recreation and revelry. The legacy of Native Americans and enslaved Africans has seeped into its soil and borne fruit. We are centuries later now, and still this sacred ground calls to us to remember, to be, to be. Beat Congo Square. Be Congo Square. Beat B. Be. Beat B. Be. Remember. That was Luther drumming in there. Luther at the beginning, the, the, the African drummer in Congo Square, and then at the end, in Congo Square, and I just noticed that you were in, the, in that second part, too. Fortunately, we got great people. I should have kept my shirt on. <laughs> he wants me to digitize it to make it slimmer in the opening. Okay, uh, so we'll probably have some questions and things from that a little later. We're going to go on to uh, Freddie Evans, the author of um, the Congo Square. And um, I, you know, in the looking at the history of the, the sacred space, there have been so many names um, throughout the, the, um, the various periods. You know, we have the French period, the Spanish period, the American period, and there are various names, and I had been talking to Freddie about the different names, and if she could talk about, we'll just start off talking about the name Congo Square, and if she could, she's gonna uh, show some, uh, some, some, maps. some maps so we can really see because it's so important for the physical development of the city. Um, so she's going to talk about names and the physical development of the city. Thank you. Like you said, the names changed during the various periods. There were official as well as unofficial names. You know how that can be, nicknames, so to speak. So I found many of these names on the different maps. And what you would see is a maps through the years, during the French period, Spanish, and then the American. Some of those names were Plas Publique, Plas de Negres, Plas Circuit, uh, Circus Park, Circus Place, Circus Square, Congo Park, Plas Congo, Congo Plains, Plas de Arms, and Beauregard Square. Uh, and some of the names that I found in the WPA interviews, those were interviews taken in the 1930s and the 1940s, were uh, Negro Square, the Negroes, some of the travelers who came to New Orleans and talked about Congo Square called it the Green, the Green Expanse. Um, Congo Ground, Congo Green, and one person even called it the Parade Ground because that was a location for parades, military parades, police parades, as well as circus parades. But the name Congo Square was popular when some of these other names existed. It was the uh, name that appeared on maps in the 1980s. The last map that you see was a map uh, that was published in 1983, the Robinson's Atlas map of the city of New Orleans. And that map had Congo Square as a location. But then, as in 1893, during the same year that uh, General Beauregard passed away, the name was changed officially by city ordinance to Beauregard Square. And that name lasted for 118 years until just last Thursday. The city council officially named Congo Square Congo Square. Can we uh, also speak to this space as a, a public gathering place? Because that was also very important, of course, with the city of New Orleans. Uh, it's sort of like a, a, a major, you might say, outside space city. Um, and we have all these uh, parading traditions that are outside, the second line clubs, the uh, Mardi Gras Indians. And people just like to be outside in New Orleans, even if you're just sitting on your step talking with your neighbor, uh, stoop sitting and, and other things. So let's talk about it as one of the first gathering places and and the fact that the Africans actually were not the first ones there. <laughs> exactly. We know from um, historians who published early histories of New Orleans that Congo Square was a gathering place for Native Americans. This is where they held their corn festivals, even before the foundation of the city, because of course you know that they were native to this area and, and 
resided here. And the area along Congo Square, which lay proximity to the Indian Portage and Bayou Road was high ground. And so that in itself attracted Native Americans. And that is also where the first settlers, first group, uh, French settlers um, resided on Bayou Ridge, that area. But we also know from a traveler, uh, not a traveler, he was an early colonist, Duprat, who came to the colony during the founding years and who ended up being an overseer on the, on the um, King's Plantation, which was located in Algiers, that Native America, that it's like the Africans danced there as well during those early, early years. So Congo Square was one of the early gathering places for Native Americans and then for enslaved Africans, but also on other plantations throughout the, the colony, including the West Bank. And it was that several gathering places were authorized, so to speak, by the city council, by the mayor, until 1817. And then Congo Square became the only authorized gathering place uh, after that year, which was way into the American period. So before there, there were several others, and my book will point out some of the other places. And will you speak to the, the economic development that was uh, developing there, right, at the, sort of like a produce market first, right? Well, like, actually, yeah. um, buying and selling was always a part of the, the gatherings. Even when the press talked about the gatherings that he found on the King's Plantation, he arrived there in, in 1726. He had, like I say, come here very early as a colonizer, one of the early colonizers, but he lived in Natchez for a number of years, on Bayou St. John and then in Natchez, and came here in 1726. But he said when he arrived at the King's Plantation, there was already gatherings, dancing, and he even named one of the dances, the Kalinda, that they performed, and he said there was also buying and selling. So that was never a part of the gatherings. That was always very integral and an integral part of the gatherings. And I think when one thing that we must remember is that at the foundation of the market that was at Congo Square were enslaved Africans who were the buyers and the sellers. So they had money to, to purchase the goods, but they also had the means and the will, the spirit to produce the goods. So the market was for and by them. Can I mention there that um, during, the, during the period when the, when the Spanish controlled the city, New Orleans went through uh, actual three, three uh, colonial periods and, in pretty quick succession, the French, the Spanish, and then the Americans. And uh, during the during the Spanish period, their slave laws, which were similar to what were the slave laws in, in Havana, uh, allowed uh, enslaved Africans to purchase their own freedom, which uh, they weren't able to do under the French or later under the Americans. But so by having a, an economy, you know, the, by selling their own goods or uh, working as laborers, they could eventually purchase their freedom or freedom of their, their loved ones uh, that way. Yes, and there were also uh, three people of color who gathered at Congo Square. We must mention that as well. Did that I last, for uh, um, the free people of color mixing with um, enslaved people, was that allowed during the American period? Well, when Creasy came and one of the travelers, I get a lot of my information, I receive a lot of my information from the traveler's accounts. Creasy came in the 1820s and he mentioned free people of color gathering there. So, yes. To what degree and how long, uh, how extensive, but he did mention them in his, in his narratives. Did you find um, a lot of information about the indigenous people uh, during that, you know, the early, the earlier period? Because, I mean, it was such a synthesis of various ethnic groups. And I was just wondering how much did you find dealing with the indigenous people before the Africans came in? Or before the Africans? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a lot. There was a lot available, but I didn't put a lot in here. Only that they were the guy, one of the guys who led uh, Bienville into this area in 1699 was a Native American guy who showed him the Indian Portage. So I do talk about the importance of the culture and how it was so well established and important before the French even arrived and then the Native American, uh, uh, enslaved Africans arrived. Some information that I, that I uh, received from speaking with um, homeless people is that uh, when Freddie was talking about the annual corn harvest, they were more rituals. And um, in, Native, in Native and Indigenous people, they would have the, their rituals on sacred ground. But sacred ground was not a place where people inhabited. So, you know, your sacred ground wasn't where you lived, it was a place that you went to. 
And so this area around in Congo Square was, a, was sacred ground. It wasn't a place that the people lived. They traveled there for their rituals. And one of the things that they always did, they always would tra uh, plant a tree in the four directions, the north, the south, east, and the west. And there's a particular tree in Congo Square that is, I'd say, twice as big as any other oak tree. And um, not factually, I mean, we have not, not know that by fact, but I believe that was one of the ones that the homeless Indians probably, in fact, did plant. Because uh, from what my understanding is when when General P.T. Beauregard's name was given to Congo Square, weren't there like 20 trees planted in his honor? Oak trees or something like that? I, I, I did check that out, but that's probably true because there were trees planted during certain periods of time. Right, and there's a tree that's like twice as, three times as big as any of the other trees, so I believe that was one of the ones that was probably part of the uh, harvest rituals. And in keeping with what Luther just said, there is a timeline in my book that tells the development and the changes that took place in the in the park. So that's something that I have to look at, look, check out that year, what happened in the park. Um, let's uh, look at uh, dance for a minute. Um, we know that this was really where some of the um, African American dance styles sort of developed out mm -hmm. of you know all of this um, uh, mixing of uh, different cultures. Could you just speak to the dance uh, and why it was it was such a, a long period of time. So what? why was there such longevity as far as looking at the dance styles and to have all this for the long period of time? Because you would think after the different, during the different periods, different laws came in, but it was, it was almost like a, a continuity um, with a lot of the dance styles. Um, I think it's because the African people perpetuated dances. I mean, they didn't make these dances up. Sometimes we think that, oh, they were all just, just beating drums or they were just, you know, cutting the shine or whatever. But they were really perpetuating, continuing African traditional cultural practices. So um, one thing that we know from different accounts is that enslaved Africans danced traditional dances into the 18, late 1800s. 1890s, they were still dancing what's called the Congo dance, so to speak. And that dance just influenced so much of uh, dance in America itself. And one thing that I was able to do was to find so many connections between the Congo dance, uh, the continuations, the, um, the similarities between this dance and the dances of Cuba, the dances in Haiti, and then the longevity of it here in New Orleans. Even if you, uh, current people who I've interviewed said, oh yeah, they did this, it was just the same thing variation of the Congo dance. So I think it's because that the enslaved, well the Africans, the African descendants did not give up their traditions easily. They perpetuated them, they kept them, they passed them down like you would do oral history. They passed these dances down. And I mentioned also that the, um, the culture that developed in Congo Square, although it, you know, it's considered as African culture, it would not have been seen as it, as it was in Africa. This was kind of a synthesis of various peoples from different nations, different languages, different customs who were thrown into this mix. And what came out of it was what we uh, think of it as, new, as Black New Orleans culture. And including the, the music and, and food traditions and uh, carnival traditions and uh, a lot of other things. Well, I really want to go on to the music now. I was, I was holding back, but I just can't hold back anymore. <laughs> um, I would like for you all to talk about the development of certain rhythms, or uh, actually not the development, they, were, they came in with the, with the uh, enslaved Africans. But would you talk about these rhythms and, and how they have perpetuated themselves in, in various other aspects of uh, African American music and other musics as well, even in European music? Uh, that's a great question. When we look at um, the importation of Africans to New Orleans, I think the French pretty much brought Africans from the uh, Senegambia or from the Senegal River Basin, and they were basically Bamara, Bamara, Mandinka people. And uh, one of the great things about their rich culture, they, they, were the, they were the culture who had koras and bamaphones and djembes and things like that. They also had a very rich, uh, uh, a system of, of bartering and, 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 and commerce and trade. So I think that was something natural to them. Uh, the second phase of, of people, like you say, under the Spanish through Cuba may have been people from the Congo who were imported you know, through the Congo, through, through Cuba, into New Orleans, and then of course Haiti with the people from Dahomey or the farm. 
So then you have these three, uh, and of course you have many other groups, but those three major groups really, um, what, the, their major influences on the music in New Orleans and in this culture blended together. Uh, I know I was talking to Dr. Jeff, he was saying like the people in, in Haiti, I mean the people of the Homi had loas. The people in the Congo dealt with herbs. So when you came to New Orleans, that's the whole thing about putting potions together. I mean, people, you know, there was something new to New Orleans where you had the Haitian and the Congolese systems coming together, even with indigenous herbs and, and, and healing. And I think when we talk a lot about Congo Square, I'm, 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 I know we're in the music, but we talk about voodoo and everything, we're really talking about healing. You know, who was your doctor? I mean, there was not a, you know, you couldn't go to the charity hospital when you got sick. You had to find a healer. So I think all of that was in the music, and the music, uh, with, with, or from Senegambia, the Fawn, and the Congo, you know, in very, very uh, important ways. Um, and would you mind talking about some of the pieces that you found, uh, the musical, actually, the um, uh, printed music that you found that was sort of, um, uh, well, sort of like a, a developed from some of the rhythms in Congo Square? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have uh, an example of the sheet music of one of the most popular songs in Congo Square during a certain time period. We have to remember that the people who gather there influence what happened. And, and they came from different parts of, um, of Africa. But this is one of the most popular songs, Kwa Pata La uh, It's my closest uh, pronunciation to it. But it's, it's translated when the sweet potato is cooked. It's one of the translations. And this song came from Haiti. This is a song that Gonchal based his piece, Bambula, opus number two on, and it was written, this is a tr um, transcription from Gonchal's sister, Clara Peterson, who actually published a collection of Creole slave songs. She knew the songs so well that she could actually write them out. With, uh, and, and we also have a, an audio clip of this song being sung in the 1930s, 1939, I believe it was, from um, a person here in New Orleans. I don't think, know if it's exactly New Orleans, but in Louisiana. It's one of those clippings that was recorded during the WPA interview period, the 1930s and 1940s. So I want you to listen to this, and then I will tell you a little bit more about um, this song and how popular it was. When I remember as a child, the sun in the street, the song that everybody sang it around me, and it belonged to the uh, song of the Congo Square, like the children that I had given. So, so, for that, like, three, come on, you leave, no, no, leave. Come and we don't be old. Come and we don't be scared. Come and we do to be, my no, no, leave, my no, no, leave. The last word repeated over and over again for hours. Awesome. Um, this song was so popular, and as I said, this was a song that got you, and you can see the melody is what we call the habanera rhythm, or well, the rhythm is the habanera rhythm, and the melody line follows that. The next sheet music shows um, the same rhythmic structure. And this is a piece that Godchild published. We know that well, there's no evidence to show that he actually attended the galleries at Congo Square. We know that as a child, young child, he lived on Rampart Street. But whether he attended those gatherings and heard the song there, he heard the song or not, he heard it from his nurse, whose name was Sally. And she was the person who also passed it on to his sister who recorded it. We have a clip of, um, are we gonna be able to play Gonchon's piece? Just so you can hear the similarity rhythm and melody wise. They don't have it? Yes. You don't have it? No, I have it. Well, while they're getting it, I want to read a passage from uh, his autobiography which 
which shows the um, the influence that Sally had and the, his um, information about the, the um, insurrection. He says, I again found myself before the large fireplace of our dwelling on street ramparts, the ramparts at New Orleans, where in the evenings, squatting on the matting, the Negroes, myself, and the children of the house formed a circle around my grandmother and listened by the trembling fire on the hearth under the coals of which Sally, the old Negress, baked her sweet potatoes to the recital of this terrible Negro insurrection. And so, in other words, he's saying that there's Sally, there is uh, stories about the insurrection, and of course, there would be the songs too, but he's sitting and he, this shows the influence that Sally may have had on him. Another uh, important piece that I found regarding this song was written by Alice Nelson Dunbar in 1902, who said, those who know the weird motif of Coolidge Taylors, and that's the next slide, I know he's so busy doing anything, but after Gonchal uh, published his piece, Coleridge Taylor also published the same piece based on the melody, and he calls this piece also the African dance, Bambula. But she says, those of you who have gotten, uh, who, who know the weird motif of Coleridge Taylor's Bambula dance have heard the tune of the Congo dance, which every child in New Orleans could sing. Gonchal's dance de Negres, which is called La Bambula, is almost forgotten by this, this generation, but in it, he recorded the music of the West Indies. So we see that this strand continues to run through those two pieces, the music that Sally brought from Haiti, and which was the music from the West Indies that influenced New Orleans culture because it was one of the most popular tunes in New Orleans when Alice Nelson Dunbar grew up here. Okay, I, I was um, thinking about sometimes when the the uh, bands were drawn, I mean the, the drums were banned, it was several times during the whole history and would you talk about the reasons why they did this because you know many times they would have the drums and then they would ban them. I think it was like 1856 when they passed this ordinance to totally ban the drums when the Americans came in. But can you talk about the other times what the different reasons why they would ban the drums? Or suspend the dances, the gatherings, yes. the gatherings themselves. Because the gatherings, of course, were a time when enslaved like Africans could come together and they could plot and um, plot insurrections, so to speak. So. One example was right after the um, 1811 slave revolt. Many parishes banned gatherings, Sunday gatherings, you know, immediately. And New Orleans, new laws were passed immediately after that uh, 1811 insurrection. And um, we saw that over and over again. So many times it was because of political reasons or um, rumors of insurrections or something, the dances may have been banned. But in 1856, this was just an uh, the crackdown, so to speak. This was years mounting, um, approaching the Civil War, and there were so many, many laws and suppressions of not just enslaved Africans, but also free people of color. And that's during the 1856 band on the drums, the drumming in general. Uh, I think the CD is ready now. Let's play that example. was done by the great, the late great, the late great Moses Hogan, and that's from the Cargo Squares CD by Percussion Incorporated that came out in 1990. And uh, you talk about the music and you talk about Cargo Square, the, ba the Bambula, uh, which is the title of the, the folk song, is um, when we were researching uh, the history of the Bambula, um, first, one of the first people we, we would ask Danny Barker, well, what, what was the Bambula? And he said, well, you know, that was that was love making music. You know, we played that at night, all night long. You know, 
But it took, uh, in 1990, 91, Chief Bay came here. You know, Chief Bay, the great African drummer from, who came here from New York, and he had uh, worked with uh, Pearl Primus. And he said, yeah, we, you know, he, so he played the bamboola for us. And when he played it, we were like, our jaws dropped. This is, this is a room of drummers. Because what he was playing was the New Orleans second line. And so we were looking for something that had never, it never died, it just has evolved. And the, the bambula rhythm is from the Congo and it means spirit, that's what the word means. And so the, the second, like we're here right now, you hear the meters. I think that's, that sounds like meters of, all of, New Orleans funk is based on the bambula rhythm, the second line, the Mardi Gras Indians, all of it. In fact, the word funky, like in the, the great song, everything I do gonna be funky. I think that's the title of the Treme series tonight, is everything I do is gonna be funky. Well, you know, funky is, the word funk is a Congolese word that means positive sweat. It's like, you know, when you sweat. But it was about m music and dancing and, and you know, the, the, the honor to be with someone and share their positive sweat. You know, so, uh, and that's what New Orleans is about. So the bambula, which if you want me to, I can demonstrate, that um, this is the basis of New Orleans music. For instance, um, I'll take the bass drum part. Now, you know, Fred, you were talking about why did they ban the drums? Well, you know, drums are used as a means of communication. So whenever people drum with talking drums or anything, they were actually saying their language. So when you play the bass, the bass part of the rhythm like this, That's the bass drum of second line of Monica Randy music. But the drum is saying a word. The drum is saying bam, boo, la, bam, boo, la, bam, boo, la, bam, boo. Then you add the second part like this. showed us that rhythm it was like that was like that was an incredible breakthrough you know and uh, to know that everything we were doing still existed and it wasn't it wasn't lost at all um, and I, I would just like to ask Freddie and her research and doing the research for this book for the last at least 10 years or so um, there are a number of documents that she came across. I know we look at people like, you know, George Washington Cable, and Cardi O'Hearn, um, Benjamin Latrobe, and the Prots, but were there some that you came across that are very unique or very rare uh, from the archives? I know because she's been looking at this not only here, but also in West Africa too. And so um, could you tell us about some of the rare things that you found? Well, one thing that I was so happy to find was evidence that enslaved Africans were sold in Congo Square, because that's really a part of our history. And people had come to me, Freddie, have you found it? Have you heard it? They say that enslaved Africans were sold there. So it happened that I had to read everything, not just um, like proclamations or things that you would think, history books, and you go find those sources. But I had to read even the ordinances. And there was an ordinance passed in 1829 that prohibited um, owners from selling, well, ordinary people from selling enslaved Africans, but it exhibited the state. So those who were sold by the state were still legitimized to sell uh, Africans. And they named the locations by the streets. And they, they, these were public parks in New Orleans. And the public park on Rampart Street, which was Congo Square, was among those several where enslaved Africans were lodged for either renting purposes, purposes of hiring them out by the, by the day or by the job or whatever, or actually selling them. So that was one example of, of um, documentation that was really happy to be able to find. And another was the fact that minstrels stood by Congo Square and took 
the material, the song, the dances, the musical instruments, a combination of instruments to the stage, even to Broadway. And so I was very happy to be able to find biographies by E.P. E. Christie. Now he did not write these of them himself, but he was alive when they were written, they were authorized, they were saying the authentic biography of uh, E.P. Christie in two newspapers. And in both of those, he credited Congo Green. Again, remember one of those names that I said with, that the travelers called Congo Square? They didn't always call it the official name that was on maps at the time, but they had their own terms for it. So in his biography, it was called Congo Green. But he accredited Congo Green with providing him with his material, with his show material. And although he may have gotten material from other locations, he never mentioned any place other than Congo Green or New Orleans with uh, providing him with the material. Chrissy was one of the leading minstrels in the country. He was the one who helped to devise the open stage. Uh, well, actually, instead of having a circle on the stage, they had a semicircle, you know, which means that you know they were setting it up for the audience in Congo Square. Of course, the circles were enclosed, and everybody in there was a participant. But to take it to the stage, you have to have the open circle. So he organized people in a half moon shape, and then one person at a time would come to the center and dance, as you would in the circle, take your time to dance and go back into the crowd, somebody else would come. So he carried that um, style onto Broadway, as well as using the bones and the tambourine, which um, would be a drum. It didn't have the, the jingles on the side like we have our tambourines. He used the bands up. So the combination of instruments, the, and even the words, juba, he performed on stage, the dance juba. Chrissy also wrote a, wrote a songbook of 300 minstrel songs, so just to show you the influence that he had and that his immaterial came from Congo Green. So that was one of the big finds of the book. But there are other minor finds too. I just encourage you to read it. And I, we, have to, we can't end without talking about jazz, okay? <laughs> um, was it, is it true that Sidney Bechet's ancestor was there, or is that a rumor or a myth? Or <laughs> I, I think he stretched it. Okay. Yeah, I, but I did include it in the book, and I said, he said, you know, I always have to uh, qualify okay. things or write them. But the fact that he wanted so badly for his grandfather to have been in Congo Square says a lot, that he really wanted to identify with the location. He wanted to mention it somehow in his book, not just on the side, but as a, as a having a meaningful role, in his, meaningful role in his life. So I did include that. Okay. All right, we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, critiques, <laughs> Cheryl. Yes, Cheryl. Um, I was wondering if the Congo dance is. Can you hear? Is the Congo dance similar to the Kalinda? Which well, is the uh, a Creole um, song that's still uh, sung by Zydeco, you know, musicians that still, uh, you know, sing in Creole? Yes, I, I know exactly. Um, what the descriptions that I have in the book are different. So it is very much similar to what's called the Bambula dance, a Bambula dance. And um, I have d d some descriptions, some accounts of it in the book. So it's, it's a different dance. Uh, it's a different, the, the Bambula, um, in the, in, of course, in Congress Square, it became a dance of love. It was a dance done between two people. Um, the Kalinda was more, the rhythm was a little different. It's almost like playing um, somewhat like this. It's like, hold on. It's almost like a merengue, you know, because Haiti and Santa Domingo on the same island. But uh, the Kalenda was a, a circle dance of women with the hoop dresses, and it was, uh, you know, in Haiti it was a social satire dance where they would, you know, they would sing songs about criticizing the government or things like that, or you know, they talked about you know things that were going on in their community. So the Bambula, the Kalenda, and a dance called the Congo were three of the major dances that were, were done in Congo Square. So they were they were different. You know, but they were similar, but they were three distinct different dances. Yes. Uh, wait, where's the microphone? Um, thank you for coming. And I was wondering what steps or what things, like when the books and albums are done to kind of preserve the history of Congo Square, if you ever do exhibitions or things like that. Should we 
have a, a, an exhibition right now in the uh, grandstand that uh, has some of Freddie's uh, work and some of the maps and uh, images of the drawings of some of the uh, instruments that were done at, at the time. And also that short documentary that I showed earlier is playing in, in the grandstand. And we're, and we're hoping to make that available to schools and libraries around the state. Like, is, it was at Congo Square, it's like, yes. Ironic thing, um, we um, th there's still drumming going on in Congo Square, um, on Sundays. The next one, will be, the next one will be on Sunday, April 15th. Um, we've taken two weeks off because of Jazz Fest because we're here today, but on Sunday, April 15th, and every okay. Sunday thereafter, from 2 to 4 p.m., you can come dance in Congo Square, huh? Oh, what did I say? May, May 15th. And you're coming through the Basin Street gate because the ironic thing about all this is Freddie has gotten the, the name changed to Congo Square, but the park is closed. And there's a big issue, and there was a big cultural movement going on to open up Armstrong Park and Congo Square in light of uh, what's going on in New Orleans as far as developers coming into Treme and things like that. But if you want to join us in drumming, come to, between two and four, on, uh, start again on May 15th. And you're coming through the Basin Street, which is the side gate. And you can bring your drum if you don't have one, we have some there. Um, I would also like to say that um, Luther is also a founding member, or actually one of the main founders of the Congo Square Foundation. And it's been around since about, uh, about 21 years now. And so they're always looking for donations and they're also putting on programs and doing things in the city all the time. So if you see anything sponsored by the Congo Square Foundation, please try and um, attend. And if you Any want, other questions? If you want more information, you can uh, go to our email, congosquarefoundation at gmail.com. And we'll, uh, we'll add you to our email list and then you'll find out. Bill Summers has done some reenactment at uh, the, the Blue Nile several times a month. And we have things all over the city, so if you uh, just send us an email at Congo Square Foundation at Gmail, and we'll put you on the email list. Any more questions? Yes, we have the microphone. Where's the mic? Uh, how, did, how did city government take to uh, religion in, uh, in Congo Square? Uh, I know that you mentioned the Code of Noor, and uh, it prohibited a lot of religion and uh, promoted Catholicism. Right. Can you bring me up? Oh yeah. The uh, I think I think I think they kind of did it under their noses. I think what they thought was drumming and dancing, you know, was actual uh, religious uh, rituals and practices going on that they just didn't necessarily recognize. Got one other question. Well, in the mid 19th century, Marie Laveau would have been married in the Catholic Church, and I guess I've always questioned that as well. I'm not a historian or anything. How did that come about? Oh, Maria Laveau was a devout Catholic her entire life. And here there's, there's not necessarily any um, division between being a Catholic and being a, a Buddhist uh, either. You need, they, they if say you look at them, they're, they're very similar in style. They're worshiping saints and spirits, uh, you know, but they they believe in one God, but they, they also believe in intermediaries to that God. And, and use the Catholic saints as kind of uh, stand in for some of the, the African spirits that they are worshiping. I've heard I've heard it say that Haiti is sixty percent Catholic and a hundred percent voodoo. So two you know people in Cuba as well they they they've taken Orishas and Loas and given them saints, Catholic saints names because they had to disguise things. S similar to Brazil when they did Capoeira, which was a martial art, but they had to call it a dance. So things had to all sometimes be disguised. Any more comments or questions? Okay, well, if not, um, thank you very much for joining us, and I would certainly like to thank our panel here, the Saluga, Gray, uh, Freddie Evans, uh, Royce Osborne. And I uh, just want to mention, too, that we're looking for that full uh, limp, uh, film on Congo Square. <laughs> also want to let you know that Freddie's book, uh, Congo Square, African Roots in New Orleans, is available in the book tent. And um, if you pick it up, she might be happy to sign it for you. She used to be around here for a while. And also wanted to mention that uh, Luther's uh, group is performing here next um, Sunday 
but he also has some CDs over in the uh, music tent. We got it going on. It's the newest one. Pick it up. Should have it. And we also like to thank our sponsors again, the Green Family Foundation and the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. And the next uh, um, uh, panel is here too, and it will be dealing with the beating traditions of Haiti, uh, Louisiana, and um, well, the Mardi Gras Indians and the um, Native Indians here. So come back and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.